Art is what is in me. As the city lifts up artists of color, it gives voice to one woman with a compelling story of survival. They want to kill me. Uh, killed my friend who was with me. The Seattle Gay News has documented the LGBTQ community for decades. Now that history will finally be preserved. You can go through any one of these papers and you will find important people doing important things that not many people ever heard about. Seattle is home to superb art museums. But did you know the city has quite a collection of its own? It's an incredible variety of work. There's something for everybody in the collection. These stories and more next on City Stream. Hi, I'm Enrique Cerna, and welcome to City Stream from Seattle Municipal Tower. Twelve years ago, Black, Filipino, Latino, and Native American city workers formed a coalition to create the Ethnic Heritage Art Gallery. The group felt most of the art displayed in city buildings came from white artists. Their goal was to raise the visibility of local artists of color by exhibiting their work in spaces like this. One of those artists is Blanca Santander. Her art is vibrant. Her life story is one of survival and a passion for justice. I was child, I was really shy, a shy kid. And uh, my way to communicate with my family, uh, with everybody was through drawings. Blanca Santander may not be a talker, but she is a highly respected artist. Blanca's drawings, illustrations, paintings, and sculptures are vibrant and colorful, often promoting a message of empowerment and hope for women of color, children, and nature. I believe that a piece of art doesn't need explanation. You need to, to feel, you need to, to read what that is communicating. That is the magic of art. That magic is reflected in this self-portrait. The hair depicts Blanca's thoughts and Latin roots. The blue flowers represent the beauty of Seattle. The tattoos reflect the Nazca culture of Peru embedded in her body. Being an immigrant, all my, my traditions and, and my heritage is uh, deeply inside of me. And I, I, I put that in my canvas because it's, my canvas is uh, the, way, the best way I, I communicate. Blanca was born and raised in Peru. As a child, she showed a talent for the piano. But Blanca was far more interested in drawing, and her mother quickly realized that a music career was not going to happen. Art is what I, what is in me. Blanca went on to graduate with a degree in fine art from Catholic University in Peru's capital city, Lima. Besides art, she had a passion for social justice causes and preserving the environment. She worked for an NGO, a non-governmental organization promoting those values. The job took her into the Peruvian jungle to help indigenous tribes. It was there Blanca would have a life-changing experience. I traveled to places where, where, where more the danger was there, uh, really close to me. It was a time of brutal civil war in Peru. I saw firsthand all the suffering of people, indigenous people, basically. It's estimated that some 70,000 Peruvians, the majority indigenous, were killed during the two-decade-long civil war. Blanca nearly became one of them. Blanca and a friend were captured by terrorists and held captive at gunpoint. For three hours, one of the terrorists kept jabbing a pistol into Blanca's stomach threatening to shoot her. They want to kill me, uh, kill my friend who was with me. Somehow, shy Blanca managed to find her voice 
and convince the terrorists to let them go. I don't know what happened in your brain when you are in an extreme uh, situation, but um, my brain worked like uh, in levels, like one level of my brain was saying, uh, be careful, speak, talk to him, try to convince him other level of my brain, say I can die here. The incident took an emotional toll on Blanca. She left Peru and relocated to Seattle, where her mother was living. Here, she started a new life, focusing on her art. I reborn here with my career and everything. Blanca is active in Seattle's Latino community. She often contributes her artwork to immigrant rights and social justice causes. One issue in particular, former President Trump's zero-tolerance policy, separating migrant children from their parents, prompted her to create a short film titled Testimonios, documenting the plight of the children held in detention facilities at the southern U.S. border. They are brown like me. They, they go directly to me, to my heart, but not only because they are brown. They are children. That is the most important thing. They are children. My sister has been very sick. We sleep on a cement bench. There are two mats in the room, but the big kids sleep on the mat, so we have to sleep on the cement bench. Blanca's son, Nick, and his student friends helped her produce the film. Blanca created the visuals with testimonials from the children about their detention, their treatment, and the pain of missing their parents. Every night, my sisters keep asking me, when will our mommy come get us? I don't know what to tell them. I saw the suffer of children firsthand, like I told you, uh, back in my country, and I can't stop relating that those children with these ones. The COVID pandemic has not stopped Blanca from creating public art, like this piece at Seattle's Cal Anderson Park. And in South King County, you can find her mural work in the city of Kent. Blanca Santander's home studio is her sanctuary. Here she finds her voice each day by doing what she was meant to do. Sometimes my husband say, okay, you are not in a good mood, go, go and work. <laughs> I can't live without creating. The Ethnic Heritage Art Gallery usually holds an annual exhibition of works from artists like Blanca here in Seattle's Municipal Tower, but it was canceled because of COVID. Now that will change once we get through the pandemic. Next, Blanca is working on a new project that will combine her art and video. If you'd like to see more of her extensive collection, go to BlancaSantander.com. Next on City Stream, it's been documenting one of the city's most prominent communities for decades. Finally, that history is being preserved. It's really meaningful. Like this, this is um, an important time to memorialize. The AMP is a place of public art that's uh, meant to raise awareness around HIV and AIDS, tell the stories of those impacted by HIV and AIDS, and uh, to be a call to action to end uh, AIDS stigma and discrimination. What is, what is typically kind of seen as a, a piece of ephemera, something that would be discarded at the end of a demonstration, we felt was important to monumentalize because they actually have a, a great amount of power. Different 
messages that tell this overarching story of positivity, but then also anger, and the real experiences of people that experience the crisis. It's important that we remember our, our history, that we remember that what was experienced around uh, HIV and AIDS, that we're remembering the people that we've lost and we're remembering the people that stepped up and cared for each other and, and did things to make a difference. Teams of volunteers are working to preserve decades of history, focusing on Seattle's LGBTQ community. For 46 years, Seattle Gay News has documented everything from the AIDS crisis to violent attacks against members of the community to Seattle Pride celebrations. Now former Seattle City Council member Tom Rasmussen is spearheading an effort to archive this valuable history for future generations. Roberto Romero has more. It's like a time machine you, when you're going back into those things. I see what's happened. In the basement of City Hall, history is being saved. Now, this is an amazing project of preserving 45 years of the issues of the Seattle Gay News, one of the most uh, long-lived uh, and uh, beloved uh, newspapers for the gay community, LGBT community in the U.S. After the paper's longtime owner, George Bacon, died in 2020, Former Seattle Chief Librarian Marcellus Turner wondered what would happen to all the papers back issues. The newspapers were piled in uh, storage lockers, outside, in uh, offices, and we had to assemble literally hundreds and hundreds of boxes and bring them here to City Hall, to the city archives, and then begin the process of sorting and organizing. From 1974 through today, there's a lot of paper here. A lot of paper means a lot of work. We have to go through the boxes one by one, and we have to be really careful that we put them all in order, they're all in sequence, and they're complete. Six, seven. Week by week. Volume 13. Month by month. 87, 88. Year by year. 12 issues. With the help of the Seattle Municipal Archives. Oh, this is the March on Washington. Volunteers work their way through history. So I wanted to come down here myself and educate a little bit more about uh, the deep history that no one is reading about. It's a history that former council member Rasmussen not only lived, but helped to shape. I am in some of these papers, and that's one of the remarkable things about the Seattle Gay News. The SGM fiercely supported uh, people who were leaders or who wanted to be leaders. If you can go through any one of these papers and you will find um, important people doing important things that not many people ever heard about. It's those stories, those people, that Seattle Gay News put in print. They recognized people who were fighting actively at great cost to their privacy and their personal lives. Stories of soldiers fighting for the right to serve, stories of heroes, and stories of struggle. Our every issue, there was a story uh, typically above the fold on the front page of someone uh, in the community, uh, either someone known or someone unknown, who was the victim of violence. And uh, that was a weekly occurrence at one point in our history. This is something shocking to see is just the extent of the crisis of violence and discrimination against the um, community. These articles were fairly frequent. There's one, there's another, you know, called names. Guys jump out of the cars in front of a gay bar and beat up a, a gay man. Those were included too. So that's, those are the kind of articles that were front page in the SGN, but they might've been buried if reported at all in any of the more traditional newspapers. And there was another story the paper refused to ignore. There was a new disease. Uh, it was killing people quickly, and it was mostly gay men, and it was called the gay cancer. SGN reported on the new sickness weekly. And so you see this, uh, this scary reporting starting, and you wonder what the hell, at that time we were wondering what the hell is going on. People are getting sick and dying. And they produced, I think, one of the most startling uh, 
images of the early days of AIDS. These are the names of people who died of AIDS. Who's on? In Seattle. There, page after page after page. That's fine print. Well, we can look back today and have a perspective that kind of glosses over the pain or even the celebration and joy that was experienced. The pain, the joy in black and white. This is a fun one. The village people made their one and only appearance in Seattle. From a one page newsletter to pride editions as thick as the Sunday Times, the Seattle Gay News has been the first draft of history for a community. The LGBT community and their history is just as important as anybody else's history, so it's very important that it be saved and it be shared and passed on to future generations. Our lives today didn't just happen by chance. What we have in our community, the LGBT community specifically, is a result of uh, a lot of hard work by a lot of people, and the details of that, how that was done, uh, is recorded in the paper, and that recording, that history, helps to ensure that the truth is told, and people re really understand uh, more about themselves and our community, and why we are the community that we are. Full sets of the paper will be passed on to institutions across the country, from the Seattle Public Library to Yale University, and maybe even the Library of Congress. Now, if you don't want to get ink on your fingers, the long process of digitizing the issues is set to begin this fall. From preserving history to propping up businesses, a splash of creativity has brightened many boarded up storefronts, shuttered by the pandemic. Producer Randy Ng took a look around the city. Once the pandemic is over, many of the business owners are planning to bring the artwork inside to their establishments so that people can continue to see the artist's creations. We'll be right back. I volunteered out of the Minidoka, Idaho concentration camp to fight with the all-Japanese American 442nd combat team and the 100th Battalion from Hawaii. 
We wanted to prove our loyalty to America. We will never serve a country that keeps our families and us captive. Yes, we will prove our loyalty and fight for America. I became a sergeant in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Our motto was the Hawaiian dice player saying, Go for broke! Many of the 442nd 100 paid with their lives at the same time their Japanese-American friends and relatives were in American concentration camps. The 442nd 100 never lost a battle, never retreated, and never left a comrade on the field of battle as they held their go-for-broke banner high. Stream returns from the Seattle Municipal Tower Gallery, which features 29 works of art from two dozen Northwest artists. The art was selected and curated by seven young people. They're part of a program that supports young creatives of color by including a contemporary voice into the city's art collection. This gallery draws from the city's portable works collection. It was started back in 1973 and now contains an impressive 3,200 pieces, including sculptures, paintings, mixed media, photography, and textiles. Producer Ian DeVere takes a look at the collection and how art is chosen for the public to enjoy. So we have the abstract to the realistic to the more conceptual, Sometimes we have just documentary photographs that just document place or people, but we also have like conceptual photographs that are um, more about ideas and situational. It's a little over 3,000 pieces. It's an uh, incredible variety of work. There's something for everybody in the collection. So the Seattle Arts Commission was actually formed in 1971. So I think we received a few pieces then, and then the 1% for our program started in 1973. Oftentimes it's City Light or SPU when they build a new uh, facility, 1% of the capital cost goes to art. Sometimes uh, permanent artwork that's situated at the facility itself, but a portion of that 1% actually goes to portable art purchases. And it's one of the most renowned in the country. So we're one of the first municipalities to actually have a 1% for the arts program. And so not only is it great for the arts and bringing arts into the, the city culture, but also I think it's a, it's a great um, engine for innovation and for, for keeping artists active in this region. So we have what's called peer panel review. On our website, we have a call for artists that stipulates what the, um, the parameters are. So often they're themed, sometimes um, we get three to 400 applicants. So we set up a panel to actually review those submissions and then they actually whittle it down. And so that's how it comes into the collection. Probably the most famous person we have is Jacob Lawrence, Gwendolyn Knight. We've got a lot of the Northwest mystic painters, Guy Anderson, other artists like Robert Yoder, um, Sherry Markovitz, Peter Millette, Michael Spafford is another one, Elizabeth Sandvig, and then all these, the newer artists that are super excited and are just emerging um, to be able to, to be a part of that collection and dialogue together you know, from the 70s to present. I think of it as sort of a living historical document that keeps expanding, so it's a history of Seattle that we keep adding to. And then we get to be a part of it by being able to collect it for the city and actually distribute it throughout city buildings that uh, the workers, you know, employees can see and also, you know, the public can see, so. So let's pick those like four to five pieces first. So usually someone from a department um, contacts me, so case in point was a IT department and they decided they, they had just moved into new offices. The general way it works is they would send me a floor plan of their space, and I would meet there and actually mark spots that can have 
artwork. So we're going to start as you enter. So, and then they form a yep. committee of up to three people, and then they set a time with us to come down to the art service center, and they actually physically choose artwork from it what we have in stock at the moment. And we can do a, a yes, maybe pile. It's an amazing variety of work. We have prints, we have works on paper, we have um, technology, we have stuff that lights up, little dioramas. You can't tell them when you look at them from the outside, but once you look through the hole, it's like the whole other world opens up. If you don't like certain things, there's always something for, for you in the collection, because we have, I think, just a little bit of everything, it seems like. Here interests you? I wouldn't mind that. Okay, where would you like it? Right, okay. You know who did that, right? Like, Me. Oh, perfect. Before I worked here back in early 2000, I think it was 2001, uh, the city actually bought some of my work. So I'm actually part of the collection. So it's, that's kind of a fun, fun thing to run across my work every now and then. And now that I'm actually working for the city and specifically the public art program, I just like seeing my friends every day because I know a lot of the artists um, that are in the collection so I, I get to tell uh, friends of mine that are artists, like, oh yeah, we just hung your artwork up in City Hall or you know, City Light, um, just purchased one of your pieces with, and I just saw it today. One of the highlights for artists is anytime you sell a piece of work, especially to a nice, uh, a nice collection like we have, it's really a kind of a joyful experience to make that phone call because it's gonna be seen by a lot of people and it has a life. That wraps up this episode of City Stream. If you'd like to watch more great Seattle Channel programming, visit our website, seattlechannel.org, and click on Feature Shows. I'm Enrique Serna. Thank you for watching.